Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum. I am almost out of my Kiro Rai, but I think I have another bottle stashed away, so we should be okay for a while. Uh, today we are doing another batch of Q&A questions from the fantastic folks like you who support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. It is you guys who ensure that Forgotten Weapons is here every day. So. Without further ado, let's get right into some questions. Hmm. Wait, there one, there is one more ado, and that is something that I want to mention because we're coming up on the end of its campaign. That is an Indiegogo campaign that is being run by Real Time History. They are the folks who are the production crew behind The Great War on YouTube, as well as a couple of really good documentaries that they have done since, uh, one on the Battle of Berlin and one on the US invasion of Germany in World War II. They apparently have gotten tired, being mostly Germans, they have gotten tired of doing documentaries on battles that Germany lost, and so they have decided now to do one on ba a battle that Germany won, and that is a real-time, week-by-week documentary history of the, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 which, despite the fact that it involves the French army being thoroughly trounced, I'm really looking forward to. So uh, I'll have a link in the description below to their crowdfunding Kickstarter. Um, they're doing this because there is no other way for them to fund a properly uh, professional documentary series like this. YouTube just, it's not possible on YouTube, so what they're doing is pre-funding it on Indiegogo. Uh, I signed up myself, and if you're interested in the Franco-Prussian War, which you should be because it's pretty cool, and it was uh, a fundamental building block for 20th century European history, you should head over to their Indiegogo and check it out as well. So now I think that's all of our adus, so let's jump right into our first question which comes from Casper, who says, did the countries involved in World War I and World War II respect neutral countries' patents? Like, how come nobody made Madison light machine guns during World War I? You kind of have two questions there. One is, did they respect international patents? And the other is, why didn't they necessarily start building other guns? And they're not necessarily integrally linked questions. So the patent thing I am less... Uh, less confident in the details on. There were certainly some areas where patents were observed, there were others where patents were not. Um, but I think the more historically interesting question is why didn't countries start building like other guns, like the Madsen light machine gun during World War I? And the answer is it's difficult and time consuming to set up manufacture of a new gun. Uh, I've had a number of videos in the past few weeks talking about some examples of that. Well, it gets even more difficult if you don't even have the technical data package to do it. So if a country wanted to produce Madsen light machine guns, they would have to get the technical package from the Madsen company in Denmark. Now, Denmark was a neutral power in World War I, and they wanted to stay that way. And one important element in staying neutral is not being seen as an arms supplier to one side or the other. And so that's largely the reason that Madsen light machine guns weren't put into production by anybody. So first off, every country has its own limited production facilities that by the time anyone realizes that the Madsen light machine gun might be a really useful weapon, all of their production facilities are already pretty well occupied. If you're Germany, you're making Mauser 98s, you're making MG08 Maxim guns, MG0815s, 815s and a variety of other weapons, artillery, ammunition, as quickly as possible and trying to set aside a new production facility to make this brand new gun that in hindsight we recognize as being tactically valuable, but it would be an uphill battle to convince German high command of that during World War I. Well, you've got to convince them to stop manufacture something else, because if you had the capacity to just add more stuff, they already would have added more production lines of the guns that they already needed and, and knew how to make. If you are able to convince someone to make it, you then have to figure out how to make it and actually get it into production, and that's going to be at least a year-long process. Uh, and we can see that with some of the new guns that were developed during World War I, which by the way there are not very many of. The Shosha is probably a really good example of this, where it existed prior to World War I as sort of a prototypey aircraft machine gun design that, they, that was adapted into a ground gun. Uh, in infantry automatic rifle, basically. And even it then took a substantial amount of time to actually get into production. 
like it's designated the Model 1915, it was 1916 before there were really significant supplies of them to be used, and that was a gun that was engineered to be as easy as possible to manufacture. The Madsen is not a cheap or easy gun to make, it's a pretty darn complicated gun, in part because of its very early lineage. So to wrap it up, in general, once you're already at war it's often too late to adopt much in the way of new guns. Um, there's not that much brand new development that goes on. Uh, if we look at German production in World War II, yeah they had a lot of new firearms um, that were developed during the war, but if you look at them most of them development started early in the war and didn't, they didn't actually get into serious large-scale production until towards the end of the war. Uh, and that was also with Germany having access to substantial additional manufacturing facilities in the territory that they captured. They had access to Saint-Étienne, they had access to Brno, they had access to a whole bunch of other non-German manufacturing facilities. In World War I there was a lot less of that. Uh, and so it's not just not feasible to put a new unknown product into production. The patents the intellectual property, that was really a pretty minor issue in the grand scheme of things. Uh, second question is from Ishmael, who says, Can you talk about the MG34's use after World War II? Can you discuss Norway's attempts to rechamber it for 7.62mm? Did any other nations rechamber uh, MG34s? The answer is no. Uh, Norway was the only country to it was not the only country to continue using the MG34 after World War II, but it was the only country that actually converted it to other calibers. So um, there were a number of places that used MG34s. There were of course a ton of surplus ones left over after 1945. Um, Israel is a notable example. Uh, they procured a whole bunch of MG34s out of Czechoslovakia, uh, and they were used by Israel starting in 1948 and probably a little earlier. Uh, Romania used the MG34, and there were small use by a bunch of other countries, uh, because there were so many surplus guns out there, especially smaller militaries. However, it was only Norway that rechambered them, like I said. Uh, so Norway also had a huge surplus, a huge stockpile of MG34s in its possession at the end of the war. There had been a massive German troop presence in Norway, troops that were stuck in Norway, uh, largely, or at least in part because of the actions of the Norwegian resistance. Um, as well as actually they had a ton of Mauser 98Ks as well. Uh, all these guns that were surrendered to the Norwegian government when the war ended. So Norway's use of the 34 was largely a result of its having all these 34s, and initially what Norway did, well first they used them in 8mm, uh, but eventually they, Norway standardized on 30-06, and it converted 8mm uh, Mauser 98s to 30 out 6, and it also then converted its MG 34s, or several thousand of them, to 30 out 6. Uh, and that was reasonably successful. That was designated the MG 34 F1, kind of like the Mausers were the M98 F1. And that worked until eventually, you know, Norway's looking at upgrade, at, at re standardizing again into 762 NATO. They never really did that with Mauser 98s. Um, they would go ahead and adopt the G3 instead. But they did have a program to convert those MG34s to 7.62 NATO, and that conversion actually didn't work very well at all. The problem is there's not that much ballistic difference between 8 Mauser and 30 out 6 that they were able to like handle that with adjusting the booster uh, cone size, or the booster outlet size on the guns. 308 becomes has substantially less power to it than 8 Mauser though. And so then, in order to make that conversion, they start running into a lot more issues. They lighten the barrels to allow it to unlock faster, but that also results in higher parts velocity when the parts cycle, which causes broken parts. Um, there were problems with the overall case length, the overall cartridge length being too short, causing feed issues. Um, some of the conversions were just not very well done. This was the, the 308 version of the MG34 in Norwegian service was just a home guard thing. So it was given less priority than frontline weapons, and thus the conversion wasn't done as well, and it was generally regarded as a failure. Um, the good source for that, by the way, is Folky Mervang's books, two books on the MG34 and uh, MG42. Primarily his second volume talks uh, at more length uh, about post-war use of, in fact, both of these guns. So 
The 34 was in many ways regarded as a superior weapon than the MG42. The 34 was it was a more expensive gun to produce, but in frontline service, its le its its lower round uh, rate of fire was generally appreciated. The MG42 went through a tremendous amount of ammunition, and a lot of its users were not particularly thrilled by that because they were the people who had to cart all that ammunition around, and when it ran out, you're in trouble. So. Um, so yeah, the MG34, where available, was a relatively popular gun with small-scale military forces that were looking for something available as surplus. Israel is really a perfect example. Our next question, this segues nicely, is from Thilo, who says, The German MG42 continued to be used by several countries after World War II, including, including the German Bundeswehr, where it was called the MG3. Do you think that 42 or MG3 would still be a viable weapon today, or was the Bundeswehr justified in phasing it out in favor of the MG5? What are the advantages of the MG5 over the 42 slash MG3? So uh, after World War II, the reconstituted German army, in fact, originally just used MG42s in 8mm Mauser. Uh, these guns were, as they were redeveloped, they were redesignated the MG1 in 8mm Mauser. Eventually, uh, they were converted to 7.62 NATO, which got the designation MG3, uh, and then the MG3 was actually put into production by Steyr, and used by a substantial number of countries through the Cold War. This, the 42, despite its aforementioned very high rate of fire, was a pretty darn popular gun. This starts from the fact that there were a ton of them around at the end of World War II, easily available to pretty much anyone who wanted them, but it really was a quality design. It was relatively cheap to manufacture, which is part of why Steyr put it back into production. Um, they would be formally used by Denmark, uh, by Austria, by Greece, Iran, Italy, Pakistan, um, and of course Germany. So when we get to today, one of the, there are a couple downsides to the MG42. Uh, one of them is the very high rate of fire. One of them is also the weight. It is not a light gun, and today with use of things like polymer and aluminum and better heat treating capabilities, we can make a much lighter gun. And I think those are the two, well, those are two of the main benefits of the modern MG5 over the MG42 and its variations. The MG5 is a lighter gun and it uses, it has a, a lower rate of fire that reduces ammunition consumption. The high rate of fire doesn't really actually make it more effective. Uh, perhaps in a few specialized roles like anti-aircraft, but Let's be honest, you're not using a machine gun for anti-aircraft fire today. Like, aircraft go too fast and stay too far away. In 1942 that was a thing, in 2021 that is really not a thing. So uh, the other advantage of the MG5 is it is in current production. The MG42 in a lot of countries is, or MG3, is getting to the point where there aren't a lot of parts left around. The guns are old, the guns are wearing out, and you're going to have to replace them with something. You could, in theory, replace them with a whole batch of new MG3s, but you could also just as easily replace them with an MG5 that's going to be cheaper, lighter, and have these other benefits. Our next question is from Shox, who says, In many videos about prototype firearms, there's talk about military trials or troop trials. Is there a difference in limited military trials, i.e. three prototypes get tested for safety with bad ammo, etc., uh, versus troop trials when a thousand units are sent to real military soldiers? How do these units do testing if they aren't in an active war zone and they aren't in an adverse environment? This is a really good set of questions. So there absolutely is a difference. Uh, generally your prototypes are guns that have been handmade by a, a factory tool room shop. Uh, and they're being tested to see how is the basic concept. Uh, is this a gun that it makes sense to produce? Troop trials, on the other hand, are generally taking the beginning of a production line process and finding out what's actually going to happen when you put it in the hands of, of marine grunts. Uh, so troop trials are often done, like they'll issue the guns out and the troops will go on exercises, the same sort of exercises that they would take uh, for regular training with any other arms that they would normally be armed with. So um, they're going to go out, they're going to do shooting practice, marksmanship practice, drill with them, take them out on you know lengthy multi-day or multi-week operations, simulated operations, and that can absolutely be an adverse environment. Now it's not always going to catch everything 
that might be an issue with the gun, but it's going to catch a lot of things. Uh, a really good example that comes to mind is uh, when the French were field testing the MOS 36. It had, the bolt on the MOS 36 is really easy to disassemble. There's a plug on the back, you push it in a little bit, rotate it 90 degrees, and pop! Out comes the bolt plug and the firing pin and the firing pin spring. Fairly similar to the Arasaka, actually. Well, and, and this worked great in testing. In field trials what they discovered is when they gave them to cavalry, and these guys have them slung across their back, and they're actually riding around on horses, uh, or in vehicles, the rifles are getting bounced around, and it turned out that bolt plug could actually work itself loose on its own and fall out, and when it fell out the firing pin went right down with it, and all of a sudden you have a completely useless rifle. And uh, I actually have copies, of, or have transcripts, of some French arsenal communications where like they're reporting that this one company of, of troops was out doing field trials and they lost 23 bolt plugs. Uh, but they were able to recover like 15 of them. Which, you know, I can just picture all the soldiers on their hands and knees crawling across a field with some sergeant yelling at them that, you know, no one's going back to base until they find all the bolt plugs. That's the sort of thing that you won't find in like an endurance trial or, you know, the sort of take a couple prototypes and see if they work through extended periods. It's the weird little stuff that you, you don't predict, that you don't think about, that happens to guns when they're actually being carried around in the field. So that's what you see with troop trials. Um, another good example would be the US uh, troop trials of 45 caliber pistols uh, circa 1907. They produced, uh, shoot, I should have looked this up beforehand, a couple hundred or a thousand of um, 1911 and Savage 1907. Well, it wasn't then 1911 at that point, but Colt and Savage pistols, and sent them off to a couple of different uh, companies in different parts of the U.S. to you know carry these for a year and practice with them and take them out in the field and tell us what goes wrong. So that's that's the sort of testing that you get with troop trials. Uh, occasionally, that sort of thing does happen in an active combat zone. Um, for example, there were at least one or two EM-2 rifles that were shipped over to Malaya uh, and taken on patrol, like active combat patrol in Malaya, to get a, some feedback on how do these things handle in actual combat. But more often those troop trials are done by troops undergoing regular training and simulated campaigning. Next up is a question from Jesse who says, if you could pick a modern handgun and carbine or PDW to be redesigned and chambered in 7.65 French, what would it be? Also you could make an FG, FCG9 in 7.65 for real. I could, but like the whole point of 7.65 French, the only the benefit of it is that it's small. And putting it in a chunky big old gun like an FCG9, uh, or FGC, he misspelled it here, FGC9, um, kind of defeats the purpose. So, eh. I mean, neat, but not practical, just a fun thing. If I were to actually take a modern handgun that I could chamber in 7.65 French, it would be a SIG P365, because that is a little tiny gun that I think would really stand out in a slightly smaller caliber than 9mm. 7.65 French is about the same overall length as 9mm, it will fit in the magazine well, it's smaller in diameter because it's a straight walled cartridge, not bottleneck, so you could probably get like 15 of them in a flush fit 365 magazine. You're going to get a little bit less recoil than you would with 9 Parabellum, which would be nice in a gun that small. Stick a red dot on it, it's going to be a tremendously nice gun to shoot. You could load that thing up with modern designed hollow points. Uh, the 765 French really isn't a slouch of a cartridge, it's not super wimpy. Um, and because it is smaller diameter and higher velocity, it's going to respond well to modern hollow point design. Um, you've got cartridges like the 327 Federal that have good bullets designed for them, and uh, that sort of combination in a P365 I think would be a really cool gun, and I would love to have one. Um, as for a PDW, that's a good question. Might be interesting to see something like a P90, where you could probably squeeze I'd have to look at the actual case diameter of 5.7 versus 7.65 French, uh, but I bet you could get a solid 40 rounds into a P90 magazine. That'd be kind of cool. Um, 
again, with most PDWs are relatively large and you don't really gain that much benefit from dropping from 9mm to 7.65 caliber. Uh, you know, the gun's not really going to be any smaller. Uh, you, the recoil is not as much of an issue in a PCC. So I'd focus on the handgun. David says, <laughs> what would you say is the least appropriate gun you've taken to or seen at a backup gun match? That's an easy one. First off, I'm pretty much the only person who takes totally ludicrously unsuitable guns to the backup gun match. Most other people are like, if they're taking something unsuitable to a backup match, it's a standard full-size pistol like a Glock or an XD or something. Uh, for me, the most uh, impractical one I've ever taken was a Wilde Survivor, which was completely and thoroughly impractical. Uh, the Linda carbine that I took, or Linda pistol, was even was bigger than this, but more practical uh, because it was a lot more shootable than this behemoth. Uh, by the way, I still owe you guys a proper video on this thing, which I will do, I promise. I'm just not exactly sure when. Big Cheese 1000 says, Just curious, have you ever gotten your hands on an Indian Insass rifle, or know much about it? I know a little bit about them, not a ton. I have never actually gotten my hands on one. I've never seen one in person. I know that their reputation rivals the original SA-80s, which is impressive. And I know that I get a tremendous number of requests to do a video on one. So if I get the opportunity, it is very high on my list. I just need to actually find one. Nathan says, why did it take so long for M16 magazines to have anti-tilt followers when they were already frequently used on guns after World War II? I think most likely it is because it wasn't that big of a problem. Uh, it was a, a small problem, and it did get eventually addressed. But in the grand scheme of things, not really that huge of an issue. That's what you get from very long like, development process on a gun like the M16, is all of these little tiny problems that represent, you know, a fraction of a percentage of malfunctions. They slowly get addressed over the years, and after 30 or 40 or 50 years, you have a gun that is substantially better overall because of these repeated tiny incremental improvements. And anti-tilt followers are one of those. Um, there are probably also some like side issues of they increase friction in the magazine a little bit because you've got more contact surface. So it's not strictly entirely an improvement. It is a little bit of a compromise. So you have to you know, modify the rest of the magazine to make sure blah 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 that everything is in fact better with your new improvement. Adam says, would you consider an H&K Mark 23 for a home defense gun? No, not really. Um, not that there's anything like fundamentally wrong with it, but it's a big chunky pistol. Um, my question would be, what is, if I'm going to choose a home defense gun, what are the things that are important in a home defense gun? And I would say being able to uh, aim accurately and quickly, especially in low light or in the dark, is important. Uh, to me, a silencer is an important aspect to a home defense gun, because it's just, you know, on a very mundane practical level, if you actually have to fire the thing and you touch off a, an unsuppressed gun inside a small indoor room, you're going to do permanent hearing damage to yourself. In addition, you are going to, like, you're going to have some short-term definite hearing loss that will make it more difficult to recognize uh, and pay attention to what's going on around you. And again, if I have to touch off a firearm in a bedroom, I, situational awareness is going to be an important thing. So a lot of people say, oh, well, I'll put on earplugs, or, you know, earmuffs. Well, that takes time. There's all sorts of potential things that can go wrong with that. To me, drop a suppressor on the gun, and you can mitigate a lot of these issues. Uh, so the Mark 23 can be suppressed. There is a threaded barrel for it, but it's already a pretty big, heavy gun. Um, they don't have a setup to easily install a red dot optic, which I think is a really nice thing to have on a home defense gun. Uh, in low light, I'm not trying to find iron sights, and I don't need to deal with tritium. I've got a nice red dot right there. So the, like, the, the strengths of the Mark 23 are incredible durability and really good accuracy, and to me those are some of the things that are less important in a home defense gun, because I'm not going to put 20,000 rounds through my home defense pistol. I don't need it to make one-inch groups at 50 yards. 
I'm going to, if I'm using it, if I ever have to fire the thing, it's going to be within the confines of my house, which is just not that big. So, um, for what it's worth, my home defense gun is a Maxim, uh, Silencer Co. Maxim 9. It has a red dot mount, it's integrally suppressed, which is really nice. Uh, it's just a neat weird gun that I wanted to have anyway. Uh, it uses readily available magazines, uh, it runs on subsonic ammunition quite nicely. I would rather have that than an HK Mark 23. Uh, Bob says, I am interested in thoughts on the apparent disconnect between collectors seeking to acquire a series or lineage of pieces, while auctioneers saying that selling guns as a group never brings added value. So the issue is, uh, it's rare if you're selling a batch of guns of a particular collecting genre, like French rifles, it's rare to find someone who is going to want every single item in that batch. Especially if it's a large batch. You know, if you want to sell a dozen guns, you're like, I have my French rifle collection and it's a dozen guns and it's this great, you know, we got a Chassepot and a Gras and a Labelle and two different versions of Bertier and a Moss 36 and a 49 blah 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 blah. Well, the problem is you're going to get everyone who's like, oh, I want these four, but I don't need those two and I'm kind of indifferent about this one. And there's almost never a situation where you're going to get more for them as a group than if you split them up and we're able to sell the one, like the guy who really just wants a label, you sell him the label for 20% more than you'd get in a group of them, and you can sell the Moss 49 to the guy who really wants that, and it's you, you're just a lot more likely to find high bidders for each of the individual guns than you are to find someone who wants the whole set. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any good examples of places where a batch, like a grouping, really would have added value. And I guess there would, they would have to be things where the individual examples of those guns have some unique uh, characteristic that, that links them together. So perhaps if you had three rifles with sequential serial numbers, or three different models all with the same serial number, but even then finding someone who actually cares about having sequential serial numbers is going to be a little bit of a stretch. Uh, I see that from time to time on places like Gun Broker, people selling a pair of guns with sequential serial numbers and trying to get a premium for them because they're sequential. And I think there aren't that many people who are particularly drawn to the idea of two sequentially serial numbered guns. It's just, eh, like, okay, but not a big deal. So that's about all I've got on that one. Uh, David says, how is the archive project going? You previously mentioned that you're hiring an archivist slash website manager. Uh, I do have a person uh, on payroll, basically, who has been working on it. They've been doing it part-time. Um, it was something that actually worked out fairly well during COVID. Um, it's taken a little bit longer than I anticipated, but by the end of this year we should have the, the archive site uh, public, open, uh, up and running, and hopefully regularly adding more material to it. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is of course ForgottenWeapons.com, my original website, which originally focused on uh, recording things like archival photos and testing reports and original documentation, and I want to get back into that uh, as much as I can. Uh, I have a pretty nice stash of a bunch of that sort of stuff, and the original website has grown kind of out of easily searchable scale. So what we've done is we're putting together a much more searchable wiki style platform uh, to host all of this information, and I'm really looking forward to getting it online. I was hoping, like, the process of developing the whole system has taken longer than I thought it would originally, but we are getting there. We're, we're getting closer, and it will be happening. So more on that when I've got something ready to actually share. Fausto says, as a fellow left-handed person yourself, do you have a history of left-handed forgotten weapons? No, not really. Um, personally, I don't know that I've ever actually owned a deliberately, like a specifically left-handed version of any particular firearm. I honestly have always, you know, I got into shooting military surplus guns, which are not generally known for having left-hand specific versions, because the military doesn't care, they just soon make you right-handed as make the gun left-handed. 
and I've just gotten acclimated to it. Left-handed bolt or right-handed bolt actions run just fine for me. Um, there aren't a whole like there are left-handed commercial versions of firearms, but they're not really that much different than the standard right-handed versions, and I've never gotten particularly interested in them, never really owned them, never really needed to. Sorry if that makes me a traitor to my handedness. <laughs> uh, Thunderchild says, are there any other YouTube channels or content creators that you really want to do collaborations with? <sighs> so yes, sort of. The, the problem I have is there are a bunch of people that, well there are a number of people that I really enjoy following, that I would really love to do a project with. The problem is I'm not really sure what the project would be. Uh, the issue is I enjoy their content, there's not necessarily much crossover between mine and theirs, and so I've never really reached out to these people because like, what would it be? I don't want to be just like, hey, hey now a celebrity guest host who kind of has nothing to do with this and about whose specialty I know nothing. So I know people are curious, I will say uh, Dan Carlin is certainly one of these people. Um, but it's not so much because I think I have something I could really contribute to Dan Carlin's work, it's because I really like Dan Carlin's work and it would be really fun to be involved in it somehow. But I don't know how that would be. Um, it'd be fun to be involved on something with How to Drink. That guy's cool, it's a fun channel, I like it. Uh, but again, I, I don't really know what the crossover would be. He's way better at cocktails than I am, so. So yeah, there are some, but it always just seems awkward. Uh, yeah. Uh, Richard says, at what point does delayed blowback become locked, i.e. flapper or roller? There is a fundamental difference between the two, Richard. Um, essentially, if it is delayed, what it means is that the, the action is opened just by the rearward force of the cartridge case pushing back when it's fired. So typically a delayed mechanism is something that is going to uh, redirect some of the, the rearward force to slow down the opening of the action to a safe time frame. When it's locked it means that there is some second uh, source of energy that is required to do an operation to unlock the action, and then residual pressure in the bolt face, typically, will cycle the thing, or is partially responsible for cycling the thing. So um, in a roller locked firearm you will have a recoil or a gas operated mechanism that will unlock the rollers and then the bolt can cycle, where in a roller delayed mechanism the rollers are on it typically an angled surface, so they will unlock themselves under pressure, they'll just do it slowly. That's the difference. Basically, if you see that the barrel can move, which indicates a recoiling system, or that there is a gas port tapping gas off the gun in some way, that's an indication that it is a locked action and not a delayed action. Creative Cat says, could the Borchardt be considered a bullpup, and if so, does that mean that the stocked Borchardt is the world's first bullpup PCC? No, and to follow up, no. <laughs> uh, the Borchardt is a traditional pistol that just has a really bulbous lumpy recoil spring assembly hanging off the back of the action. Uh, the, the firing, the definition of a bullpup is having the trigger assembly, or the trigger, in front of the chamber, and the Borchardt does not do that. Um, frankly, the Borchardt is no more a bullpup than the Luger is. The Luger is, is essentially a Borchardt with that really clumsy recoil mechanism uh, redesigned into a much more efficient spring in the grip of the gun. Uh, Larry says, in doing research for my website there are many times when I need to research a company to see if they'd be willing to help provide info as part of my research. Uh, what years were these made, how many of these were made, when did you start doing this, etc. What is the best way you've found over the years to contact companies to see if they are willing to give you a helping hand? I realize that not everyone is willing to help, but I feel like I'm being uh, polite and not asking too many questions that are too taxing, and many times my emails go ignored. It's very frustrating, as many times I hit a wall, uh, only they know and my research just stops. I completely understand, I sympathize there. Um, at this point, I have a big enough subscriber base that I can usually get through, but even at this point, if I just like drop an email to a company's contact 
form on their website? Often as not, it doesn't get answered. Uh, I have found almost 100% of the time the best way to actually speak to someone and make you know do something with a company is to find a personal connection to someone in that company. Maybe it's like this is where personal connections really make a difference, where online internet sort of interactions just fall flat often. So if I've gone to SHOT Show and I've met a particular person and we've talked, shared some mutual interest, I have their business card, that's a person that I find I can often uh, reach out to, either call or email, and get a helpful answer. They feel like, like we have this personal connection and they're interested in helping out with something. Um, it, you know, if you have a like a personal friendship with someone who's involved in a company, that's by far the best way. But even like second or third hand, if you know a guy who knows a guy who has a guy at the company, even that sort of approach, in my experience, is significantly more likely to bear fruit than just a random, essentially a cold call. The problem is, of course, developing those connections is tricky and takes time and and often luck. Thomas says, how has COVID affected your work over the past year? To be honest, COVID wasn't that big of an obstacle for me. Um, it cut down my travel a bit, uh, not completely. Uh, it particularly cut down my international travel, but there are lots of guns to be filmed in the US. Uh, biggest thing I did during COVID was write a book. Uh, Pistols of the Warlords was photographed like just a month or two before COVID became a thing, uh, and that gave me like a full solid year uh, to turn that assembly of photographs into a nice book. So that's the biggest thing that I did. Um, I, use, I, I dug into my stash of filmed but not yet uh, published videos a bit. Um, I haven't been able to replenish that as much as I normally would because travel is restricted, but um, now that we're clearly on the tail end of COVID and travel restrictions are quickly disappearing, I hope to be able to replenish that backlog of video. Um, I also had a nice boost in subscribers and viewers, because for the past year a lot of people have had uh, a, lot of, a lot more time to sit down and watch YouTube than they did previously. So I mean, that was a benefit to me, perhaps a benefit that came out of something that was negative for most people, but there's a silver lining I suppose. Uh, me the best says, were any guns other than high powers and Brens sent to China? And what sort of markings would have been put on them when they reached China? So the first answer is all sorts of stuff went to China. Like, I don't want to say everything went to China, but basically everything went to China. During the 20s and 30s, um, every major arms company that could did business with China. Um, a lot of them did business with the Qing Dynasty government prior to 1911. Um, and then a lot of them did business with different warlords uh, after the revolution, uh, during the warlord era, during the Chinese Civil War, um, guns from FN, guns from um, like everything showed up over there. Uh, not always in huge numbers, and these are generally being purchased by some of like the, the better financed warlord armies. So you're not like there's not much in the way of this was formally adopted by blank. No, they are guns that were available, um, accessible, and got used. A lot of SIG stuff went over there. There's like some really cool 1920s and 1930s interwar weirdness went to China, because the warlords were willing to buy all sorts of stuff where a lot of European militaries were a little hesitant to, to adopt them. So ZH-29s, um, one of the major, like the biggest single sale of ZH-29s was China. Uh, during the 20s or 30s, I think the 30s. Um, the SIG KE-9 uh, light machine gun, those show up in China. Um, everything imaginable from Spain went over there, FN pistols went over there, you name it, it went to China. Um, the thing is, almost none of it actually got marked. Um, you know, We're not talking the German army doing formal proofing and acceptance stamps, we're again talking warlords, and they get it and use it and there typically wasn't much in the way of, of actual markings. You see a few. Um, late in C96 Mauser production in the 30s, like the, the German Model 30 and Schnellfeuer pistols will occasionally, um, batches of those were shipped with 
three, mar three character Chinese writing on the side of the magazine well that read Made in Germany, uh, although that was marking applied by uh, Mauser, not in China. Oh. Um, yeah, you generally don't get markings on those things. The the difference with the Brens and the High Powers is that those were they were more substantial contracts, and they were made later in the period to the nationalist government, basically during World War II. Um, that was a bit more formal and solid of a government that did request specific markings on its guns and had the clout to get them. Let's see, next up. Uh, Josh says, with gas sealing mechanisms like the ones found on the North and Skinner revolving rifle and the Nagant revolver, why don't we see, or why didn't we see more revolving rifles? I can understand not using a revolver system when you have access to high capacity box magazines, but guns like the 1903 03 Springfield only held five rounds. The big, so there are two fundamental problems with a revolving rifle. One is the cylinder gap. Uh, you don't have a continuous solid barrel. You have a barrel and a chamber, and they're separate because the chamber has to rotate because there are multiple chambers. Now there are ways around that. North and Skinner was a black powder gun that used a you know, pair of interlocking cones to essentially seal mostly. The Nagant has a pretty cool uh, system for solving this, where the brass is actually long enough, the brass is long, and the cylinder moved forward uh, when the action cycles. And so the brass actually overlaps the cylinder gap and seals it. Which is a really cool idea, but it's fundamentally not compatible with any pre-existing cartridge, because well, if you've never looked at Nagant revolver ammo, it looks a bit funky, because the brass comes out farther than the top of the bullet. And no country, like it'd be a real stretch for a, a country's military to change their entire cartridge system on the basis of adopting a revolving rifle instead of a traditional one. Then the second big issue is weight, because the 1903 Springfield holds five rounds and it has one chamber. If you were to make a five shot revolving rifle version of that you now have five chambers, and you're adding a non-trivial amount of weight to the gun. You're also adding complexity to have the whole revolving mechanism, and the aforementioned cylinder gap issue. So. Uh, fundamentally, what is the benefit of a revolving rifle over a simple magazine rifle? Um, the revolver has a number of problems, but it doesn't convey any real benefits. Uh, I suppose you, theoretically, it could be shot faster, um, but not a lot faster, and it's definitely going to be slower to reload once you expend the five rounds that are in the cylinder, or six rounds, or whatever it comes out to. So fundamentally there just aren't that many benefits, and there are a significant number of detriments to a revolving rifle, and that's why we basically don't see them. Robert says, do you think the surplus firearm market is dead? Specifically uh, primary market, like big batches of guns coming in. I honestly don't know. Um, there have been times when I would have said that yes, it clearly is dead, and then big new batches of guns come in. We just got a ton of M1 carbines out of Italy. A uh, bunch of Carcanos came out of Italy. There is of course all the smorgasbord of stuff that Interordnance is bringing out of Ethiopia. Like, maybe Ethiopia is the last big one? Maybe there are five more stockpiles like that that we just don't know about yet. I don't know. What I do know is the production of guns that will become military surplus is definitely uh, waning, <laughs> more than waning, uh, toast. Because we, in, here in the US, we cannot import anything that was originally made as a machine gun. And it's been a long time since militaries were adopting really anything that wasn't made as a machine gun. Um, all of the M16s, all of the AKs, those are guns that have come in to the US as parts kits, but cannot come into the US as conveniently accessible complete guns. You know, one or two here and there under weird circumstances, but all the Cold War era stuff, that's why, like, <laughs> it's interesting that there are some guns that I think people underappreciate in terms of their, their collectability and their historical relevance, because they are Cold War factory semi-autos. The Moss 49, 4956 guns are a good example. The SKS is a fantastic example. Like the SKS is a true, legit, factory-made military Cold War battle rifle, 
and people looked down their nose at it because they were so cheap for so long. You know what? Find me the gun that the US was using at the same time in its factory military configuration. You can't, because it's an M14 or an M16, and that's not available as surplus. So I think that's part of the reason, of course, SKSs have gone up substantially in prices. Maybe some more people are recognizing that, hey, you know, there aren't a lot of guns from this period that we can actually have easy access to, and the SKS is one of them. Uh, so I wandered a bit there, but post SKS, post MOS 49, everything that everyone was adopting was full auto, and that's not coming into the US onto the collector's market. So it's a matter of, <laughs> it's, I suppose, kind of like oil. Uh, they're not really making any more of it, it's just a question of how much of it is out there that we still haven't found yet. So we'll find out. David says, you have been sent back in time to 1906 France and have become close friends with several people involved in their armaments program. You can make three suggestions for relatively minor modifications to their small arms before war were declared TM, in 1914. Uh, what three suggestions would you make? Note, it is not possible to swap out the 8mm Lebel for something with less taper and rimless or something like that. Okay, so if we're going to limit this to easily adopted things that don't make a fundamental, don't require any fundamental shift. Uh, my three uh, suggestions would be number one, there's this Hotchkiss company, they're making a heavy machine gun, go adopt it. Because the French did not adopt the Hotchkiss until war were declared in 1914, and they were developing the Saint-Étienne 1907, which is a fantastic gun for a person like me who's into weird, collectible, obscure stuff, it is a terrible gun for someone who is on the battlefield in World War I and depending on that gun, because it is such a weird, complicated, expensive kludge. Um, the French didn't want to pay a royalty to Hotchkiss. They wanted to keep production of machine guns within the French government-owned design bureaus, and that was a mistake. Uh, and they were forced to accept that being a mistake when war were declared, and they had to adopt the Hotchkiss. But had they just... we're talking 1906, the Hotchkiss was out there. Like, Hotchkiss was selling those guns in the late 1890s. Uh, if the French had adopted it, and just you know, forget the Puteaux 1905, forget the Saint-Étienne 1907, just go with the Hotchkiss, that would have significantly improved things in World War I. My second follow-on suggestion would be, buy more of the Hotchkiss. Nobody at the beginning of World War I had enough machine guns by the standards of the end of World War I. Um, all of World War I was a period of ramping up machine gun production and issue and use. And even at the end of the war, nobody had as many machine guns as they really would have liked to have. So second suggestion is buy a lot more Hotchkiss guns. Um, we can talk about like what tweaks would you make to the French rifles, and the answer is it doesn't matter. They're not that significant for World War I. You could change the rifle a lot, and it would have this tiny fraction of the amount of impact that a crapload more Hotchkiss machine guns would have. And my third suggestion would be, now that you've adopted the Hotchkiss and bought a lot of them, train with them, and teach gunner teams how to properly use the Hotchkiss. Because that's the other thing that was in development constantly through the war, is how do we actually use these guns better? So essentially, my suggestion is, develop a proper machine gun program before the war starts, which would have been a significant advantage for the French army, and potentially, maybe, could have turned the tide somewhere before 1918. There were plenty of points in that war where things were kind of hanging in the balance, um, and maybe some changes like that could have had enough impact to, to make a difference. Now, if I can make su a suggestion that would be a little more substantive, it would be develop a submachine gun. Uh, in fact, it's interesting to me that the French overall doctrine of infantry actions in World War I, which was basically the offensive at, at all costs and at all times, always attack, 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 that's a, that, that's a strategy or a, a doctrine that works really well with submachine guns. Like, picture your, your mid-late World War II Soviet submachine gun units. Like, think of them in terms of French World War I doctrine, there's not a lot of difference there. Like, I could see Poilu with, uh, you know, an entire company of Poilu with PPSH-41s. It's a weird vision, 
but it fits with the training and the doctrine. Uh, now, was there is that really a feasible thing to tell the French army in 1906? Eh, like the nine millimeter cartridge is just barely there. Um, you could do it in 765 Luger. The cartridge is out there, but it's only a few years old. The French don't have an automatic pistol. You know, they'd, they'd have to adopt a whole new cartridge into their inventory and a whole new style of gun that nobody's really doing, that nobody understands the impact of, and I think it's outside the spirit of the question, but I think it would have been a really interesting thing for them to do. You give the French infantry a close assault submachine gun and see what that does to combat in 1914. Now maybe they all still get obliterated by artillery, um, in fact there's probably a fairly good chance of that. But. But we'll skip to our next question now, which is from Trevor, who says, Why don't handgun cartridges use Spitzer bullets, aka long pointed bullets, for better, um, better ballistics? And the answer is, they physically don't fit. So if you have uh, rifle cartridges and pistol cartridges kind of have a different take on bullet weight and size. A pistol cartridge has to be relatively short in order to fit in the grip of a pistol. In order to have ballistic effectiveness, you need a you know relatively heavy bullet, and so what you get is a relatively large bore diameter, so that you can get in nine millimeters, say 110 to 150 grain bullet, in an overall package that's still short enough to fit inside the grip of the pistol. And that bullet is very short and compact. It's it's pretty squat. Compare that to a rifle, where your overall uh, length doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters, but there's no fundamental limit, it's more a matter of tradition and what actions people are already used to. You can, in, you, you can get your ballistic potential by increasing pressure and increasing velocity, way beyond what a handgun can take, because a handgun also has to be small and light to fit in the hand. Uh, so in a rifle you can increase pressure, increase velocity, and you can then decrease the bore diameter and get your bullet weight by making the bullet longer, which at the same time helps with your ballistics, your um, uh, uh, ballistic coefficient, by having a pointed boat tail bullet. That doesn't. You try to do that in a nine millimeter pistol, and you're going to have a bullet that first off is way too heavy, uh, and then the whole cartridge is going to be too long to fit in the hand. If you try to do it with, say, a six and a half or six millimeter cartridge, you're going to end up with a bullet that is because your pressure has to be low. Uh, your velocity, you still need to have a certain height, and so you have a really tough time getting a long enough bullet to be a spitzer without being too long to fit in the gun, with and also you know fitting into your your balance of pressure and velocity. And on top of all of this, trajectory or ballistics don't really matter in a handgun. Uh, it doesn't really matter how much a handgun bullet drops because the general practical range of a handgun, certainly the effective usable range of a handgun, is like 25 meters. So who cares? You could fire round balls, you could fire wad cutters. Revolvers do often use wad cutters, it doesn't matter. Um, and so no one's ever, like there's no good incentive to have a boat-tailed long spitzer handgun bullet and go to all the effort and, and overcome all of the negative impacts of doing that for a positive impact that is ultimately meaningless. Scott says, how did the French Foreign Legion procure weapons? Were they considered part of France's standing army as frontline troops, or rear echelon, or are they something different all to themselves? Uh, the Foreign Legion is equipped as part of the standard French army uh, organization. They don't always get the exact same guns as everybody else, but this is an army where you know, different specialties of troops get different guns. So I believe it, one of the Foreign Legion regiments was one of the very first to get HK-416s. Um, they are certainly troops who are in combat a lot and they tend to have better, you know, more of the modern gear than some of the more rear echelon uh, elements of the French army, but there's no special procurement. This isn't, I think maybe where this question comes from is, like the SS in the German military in World War II was independent of the army and its procurement paths were substantially different, and as a result the SS often had kind of crummy or non-standard gear. 
that's not the case with the Foreign Legion. Foreign Legion is part of the standard French army, and equipped as such. Will says, what is your take on semi-pistol grips on lever actions? Better handling or an unnecessary upsell? I don't think they're necessary, but I like them. I think they make the guns more controllable. They give you something a little bit better to pull the, the gun back into. Given the option, I prefer to have them. Gargoul says, are you planning on continuing to explore the reliability issues in the Calico M950, or did I miss the final episode? That's a little embarrassing. I am planning to continue it. Um, at this point Calico asked me to send the guns back for them to take a look at, which I have no problem doing. Um, I welcome it. I just honestly, I got overtaken by other projects and I haven't had a chance to deal with it. Um, that's one of the downsides of like doing video six days a week, is I have a relatively short, feasible, it's not really an attention span, but I only have so much time and attention I can dedicate to any one project, and stuff tends to come up on the radar, get dealt with, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't get finished relatively quickly it can end up sort of in this quasi-stagnant place, kind of like the full video on the Wildy Survivor. Or the full video on the Alofs, which I still also owe you guys, and I really need to do that stupid thing. Because uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, it's going to be a great video, and I just... it ended up in that pile of stuff with the Calico that just I haven't had the, the time and attention to take care of. Sorry. Alright, last couple of questions here. Uh, Chris says, do you think matches like the first large DIY gun Maker's Match in June uh, will actually have an effect on reducing the negative stigma of DIY guns to the masses, or will DIY guns forever be doomed to be seen as only used by criminals? I don't think the Maker's Match is going to have any significant impact on general public perception of homemade firearms, because frankly I don't think the general public is going to ever find out about the Maker's Match, or be particularly interested in it. Um, for the time being, I think just the general attitude of people is that DIY guns are mostly used by criminals, and it's a long uphill battle to try and change that. Um, I wish everyone luck in that process, and I would encourage them to perhaps not pay that much attention to the general public perception of DIY guns, and instead focus on figuring out how to do them better and more professionally and more effectively, and um, I, I think the biggest stigma perhaps to DIY guns is that they are crude and crummy and like, perhaps dangerous to the user, and a good way to, to give them a better public persona is to fix those preconceptions. Which don't, like, don't get me wrong, um, I know there are some really really smart clever people working on DIY guns that don't have those problems, but that's, that's how the general public sees them, and that's the thing to focus on. So something like the Maker's Match I think is great, in that it encourages development within that community. I wouldn't try to extend its impact to the, the general public. Corbin says, you recently came out and said that you would be reprinting your book due to seeing them selling on the second-hand market for very high prices. It's common for firearms related books to have one print run made, never be printed again, only to have the resale price on the books be twice, three times, or more of the original sales price. Why do you think publishers or authors are so reluctant to do additional print runs of the book if there appears to be such a demand? The problem is you can't determine the demand from like secondhand sale prices. So a great example would be uh, Dolph Goldsmith's book on the Vickers machine gun, which for years has been a $500 plus book. I think the cover price was 90 bucks from Collector Grade, um, and Collector Grade never reprinted the thing. And uh, Blake Stevens, who was Collector Grade essentially, passed away a few years ago, and Chipotle Publishing under Dan Shea uh, took, undertook the, the, the project of reprinting that Vickers machine gun book. They, he expanded it a little bit, uh, they reprinted it, they actually ran a Kickstarter to fund the reprint, and it it met its funding goals, but just barely. Like it was not hugely successful as a, a funding thing, especially when you calculate in the price of the extra perks and rewards and all the stuff that they offered, which included a bunch of like Vickers machine gun classes that have got to be a substantial economic drain on the Kickstarter funding. But 
Um, the problem is, if you if you print say two thousand books, and you sell them all, and then you see the prices go up because there's the two thousand and first and two thousand and second person who really want the books. The problem is the price can go up to like five hundred bucks if nobody who owns the book is interested in selling it. But maybe there are only a hundred people who really actually want a copy who didn't get one. And in order to be economical, five hundred copies is a bare minimum, and really a thousand is a lot better to reprint. There's a substantial um, economy of scale in book printing, and printing a small run of books can become very expensive very quickly. And if there's only demand for two or three hundred copies of a book, it is literally economically not worth it for the author to reprint that book. Even though you see them going for five times the cover price, the problem is if there aren't enough people willing to, to buy that book, the reprint doesn't make sense. And I think oftentimes it's very difficult to judge how many people actually want a copy that don't have one already. Uh, most firearms reference books take a long time to sell. I don't know how long uh, that Vickers gun book was in print before it sold out, but I bet it was five or six or eight years. And I think Blake Stevens at Collector Grade looked at that and thought, if I print another thousand copies, I'm going to be out a significant, you know, out of pocket cost to do the printing, and it's going to take ten years to actually recoup that money, and then I'll break even. And so, is it worth a potential small profit? 12 years down the road to print it now? And the answer to that question often is no, it's not worth reprinting the book. And maybe that's a little bit of the, the behind the scenes stuff from the, the publishing industry that can shed some light on why we see those. Tim said, you visited and filmed in countries where handling of firearms is problematic if you aren't licensed. Or have you visited? Um, for example, here and he doesn't specify exactly where he is, an unlicensed adult can only handle a firearm on a range under direct supervision of a licensed individual. Has, a situa has this situation occurred to you before, and what was uh, needed to allow you to handle weapons at a museum or a collection? To be honest, um, I filmed in a lot of countries where that sort of regulation was the case. It's never been an issue because I've always been under direct supervision. Uh, if In the case of a museum, like an accredited museum will never let a non-employee alone with artifacts. So when I'm filming at museums, I virtually always have a museum employee who's standing like right over there, outside a camera range, typically you know doing email on their phone or you know playing mobile phone games while they're bored to tears watching me uh, film a whole bunch of videos. But there's always someone there, and so from a legal perspective, it's not an issue. Uh, and the same thing goes doubly on a firing range. No gun owner I've ever run into has said, "Ah, would you like to shoot my super rare Blastomatic 1910? Here, uh, here it is. Here's some ammo. I'll see you this evening when you get back from the range." No, they always come along because they're, you know, it's their gun. They're they want to make sure everything goes well. If anything goes wrong, they want to be there to fix it. They don't want me running off with it if it's perhaps a FAMAS, you know, that sort of thing. So, it's never been an issue. Chris says, Francophilia aside, MOS 49 or FN 49? And maybe you won't believe me that it's an objective or non-biased decision, but I will say definitely MOS 49. And here are my reasons. The MOS 49 is shorter, it is lighter, it is a significantly simpler mechanism uh, by virtue of being direct gas impingement. It doesn't have a gas piston in it. Uh, it's like it's easier, faster, and cheaper to manufacture. The MOS 49 was developed in part to be an easily manufactured rifle. Um, the MOS 49 in particular has really good adjustable sights. Um, I would say it sights, it's close, but I'd rather have the MOS 49 sights than the FN 49 sights. The FN 49 has a fixed 10 round magazine. The MOS 49 is also 10 rounds, but uses a detachable magazine, which is an improvement. The MOS 49 is much more easily scoped. Um, the FN 49 does have the capability to be scoped, or at least some of them do on the MOS. It's a standard feature. Any gun, slide a scope on and you're good to go. So really the one advantage that the FN 49 has is that it's available in calibers that are a little more readily accessible. Um, 
the most common ones for the MOS, for the FN49 are going to be OT6 and 8mm Mauser. And you can also get them, in, there are some in 7 Mauser, which would be a nice cartridge. It would be probably a little more pleasant to shoot, uh, even than 7.5 French. Overall, I think it comes down as pretty clearly the MOS49 being a superior rifle. And our last question from Tyler, better get rid of this first. Tyler says, are you a rum drinker? And if so, what is your favorite? And if it's not Bundaberg, you're wrong. Well, sorry, uh, my favorite are the really funky Jamaican pot-stilled rums. I don't have a particular brand, but I really like those. I think they have a lot more character than sort of the more traditional Spanish-style column distilled stuff. So funky Jamaican rum is uh, my preference in rum. And that is all of our questions for this month. Thank you all very much for supporting Forgotten Weapons on Patreon, uh, allowing me to be here every day, day in and day out, uh, bringing you, hopefully, cool content that you enjoy. So thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.